we are in our revelation study and we are in lesson seven the consummation of all things we are looking at how god is uh, bringing an end to his creative purposes now that he has uh, fulfilled all that his purposes that he had in this creation uh, in the next few weeks we'll look at the passing away of this uh, present earth and present heavens and the creation of something new. Um, and we know that that all happens because God has been successful in this creation to place a, uh, an intermediary ruler over creation who is perfectly subject to the will of God, and that is Jesus Christ. Adam failed to do that. He restored the kingdom through Israel. Jesus uh, was the Messiah of Israel, came and ruled over uh, the nation of Israel and ruled over the nations of the world in the millennial kingdom. And tonight we're looking at how the millennial kingdom will conclude, because the millennial kingdom is not uh, the end of all things. It doesn't continue into um, eternity. Uh, it has a purpose and it has a conclusion. And the kingdom of God will continue into eternity with all of the glory that was won uh, by Christ through the kingdom and the consummation of God's creative purposes in this world. So we look at the end of the millennium, and we're really looking at um, the end of the parenthesis on evil tonight as well, uh, tonight and next week. Uh, Christianity is the only religious system that has uh, evil bookended. Uh, in all other systems, you have evil and good cooperating together uh, for all of uh, history, and it will continue through all of the future that uh, one must learn just how to cope with evil. Uh, God reveals the only uh, end to evil uh, that any faith system has. So this uh, tonight, we're looking at a climax in evil, but it's it's kind of a pathetic climax, and we see just how uh, futile any efforts against God have been. I don't know if uh, any of you read the Lord of the Rings books, uh, but uh, the movies don't really capture the patheticness of evil. Um, if you know, um, if you remember Wormtongue and Saruman, at the end of the books, they don't just disappear or get locked in the tower. They go to Hobbiton and try to rule over the hobbits uh, because they've lost the rest of uh, Middle Earth and they're easily conquered there. Really what's happening here in Revelation uh, 20 verses 7 through 10 is Satan's last ditch pathetic effort uh, to rule over the kingdom that Jesus Christ has just successfully ruled on God's behalf. So we do want to answer the question, though, why does Satan have to be released at the end of the millennium? Uh, why doesn't God just put him away uh, with the false uh, prophet and the false messiah at the end of uh, the present age before the millennium? Why does he just temporarily store him away and then release him? Well, first, we do want to see that scripture does tell us he will be released after the thousand years. Revelation 27 says when the thousand years are completed. Satan will be released from his prison. In Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3, we saw him put away. It says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain on his head or hand, in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss. That's a temporary um, shut away for demons, and he shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. So in verse 7, we see that when the thousand years are completed, now this is the Greek word teleo, uh, which means to accomplish, fulfill, uh, to be finished, or to reach its goal or purpose. The thousand years do have a goal and a purpose, and there comes a point where that goal and purpose is fulfilled or completed. Uh, and so,
that goal is going to be uh, accomplished at the end of a thousand years, and it's going to be accomplished uh, in its entirety by the final uh, uh, nail in the coffin of Satan uh, when he is released from his prison. Uh, this word teleo uh, is the same word that Jesus said from the cross in John 19.30. He says, therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Uh, redemption had been accomplished. The goal had been reached of his going to the cross uh, in his death. And so we see this completion or this uh, totality idea. And the totality of creation is being accomplished here at the end of the millennium. Uh, when he was put away, we saw he was put away for a specific purpose. And we're going to see he's released for a specific purpose. And the purpose is the same. Um, he's put away so that he does not deceive the nations any longer. And when he is released, he is going to be released in order that he will deceive the nations, at least those who are willing to be deceived by him after living for 1,000 years under the government of Jesus the Messiah. So the answer to the why is to deceive the nations. This in the Greek is an infinitive clause, and it's an infinitive of purpose, uh, giving a reason why. Uh, in verse 8, it says, he will come out to deceive the nations, or in order that he will deceive the nations, uh, which are in the four corners of the earth. Uh, and he uses an appositive here to label uh, that Gog and Magog. So we're going to have to deal with uh, that issue here as well. What is Gog and Magog? But Revelation 12.9 shows that Satan uh, has a long ministry of deception. Uh, it says, the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan who deceives the world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. We see this great dragon that's been a character throughout Revelations was also uh, called the serpent of old, referring all the way back to Genesis then we're told explicitly he is the devil, which is the Greek word for devil, and Satan, which is the Hebrew word for uh, who he is. And those words mean deceiver. And then we're told descriptively in English uh, that he deceives the whole world. So he's called the deceiver in Greek. He's called the deceiver in Hebrew. And his activity is deceiving. The great dragon was a deceiver. The serpent of old in the garden was a deceiver. Genesis 3.13 says, Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. John 8.44 says, Essentially, this is who he is. You are of your father the devil. You want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature for he is a liar and the father of lies. To be the father of something is uh, to share in the nature or character. Uh, humanity, when it's produced, uh, reproduced, uh, it's reproduced in the same nature. Uh, we share both a sin nature as well as other characteristics. Like if your parents have dark hair, you probably have dark hair. If you have um, blue eyes, you probably have blue eyes. And to be honest, if your parents are liars, you're probably a liar too. Uh, this is uh, what we see here is that the the offspring shares in the nature of the father and Satan sharing his spiritual nature, just as God shares his spiritual nature through his son, Jesus. Uh, we see that uh, his primary characteristic is as a liar. Uh, he is also a murderer here, and he accomplished his murdering through lying. Uh, murder, the first murder actually happened um, in a sense with Adam and Eve, not with Cain and Abel, where Satan came in and convinced them to put a wedge between them and God to break fellowship with him, uh, which affected spiritual death. Spiritual death, as its result, has physical death. They died physically because they had already died spiritually and being separated from God, the sustainer of life. So Satan is a murderer and his lies caused death. In Revelation 13, 14, uh, we saw that 
the uh, the actors that he used in Revelation to affect his purposes shared in his nature all the same. Revelation 13, 14 says he, being the false prophet, deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. So using these lying signs and wonders, Satan deceives the world and convinces them to look to the false Messiah um, who had a death wound and was resurrected or resuscitated um, in order that he would deceive the world and make them believe he was a savior. Revelation 16, 13, it says, I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God, the Almighty. Satan's purpose, Satan's lies are not purposeless. Satan's lies have all been crafted for the purpose of usurping God's purpose on this earth. The will of Satan is for the will of God to be usurped. Therefore, anything that is not part of the will of God is part of Satan's will. All Satan wants is for God's will to not be in effect. Because this is how a king rules. The subjects are subject to the will of the king. If Satan is able to uh, have his will rather than God's will enacted, then this is his de facto kingdom. And that's how he rules today. He rules today because his will is the ruling will over this creation right now. This is the purpose of the millennial kingdom, for there to be a king over this earth who affects the will of God. And uh, Jesus Christ will do that. That is why Satan uses his lies for the purpose of separating Adam and Eve, the federal heads of humanity, so that um, as the rulers over creation, they did not follow the will of God, but rather the will of the creation. And now here we see him gathering the nations together in rebellion against God so that God's will would not be in effect by the kingdoms of this earth, but rather be united under a single kingdom acting in Satan's will, uh, essentially enthroning him as the king of this creation. That's his goal. Revelation 19.19 19 says, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. He used his lies and deception at the end of the tribulation period to amass a war party against God the Almighty. Satan does not change his tactics. In fact, uh, we have this similar uh, double picture at the end of Revelation as we get in the beginning of Genesis. In Genesis 3, we get the fall of man with Adam and Eve. Well, in Genesis 9, we get the fall of man once again with, uh, with Noah in his uh, vineyard, getting drunk and uh, having an interesting situation with his son, Ham. So we see that man has not changed from judgment to judgment. Uh, being separated by the judgment of the flood, man still had his sinful nature Man's problems were not fixed by the judgment. They needed a savior. Well, here we see, uh, bookending the millennial kingdom, that Satan's time away in the abyss did not cure his nature. It did not make him less of a liar. It did not make him less of a usurper. It did not make him less of an enemy of God. He did not repent in his time away. He did not change his mind. Uh, there is no savior for the angels, uh, but we see that Satan did not change in his character at all, and God is perfectly uh, validated in eternally punishing this created being, because no, no period or time of, uh, of remorseful opportunity um, is going to be taken advantage of by this creature, but God created eternal beings, beings that would, uh, would persist for eternity, 
but he's going to persist apart from God in the lake of fire. So here in Revelation 28, he comes out to deceive the nations, and those nations are in the four corners of the earth. Now this verse is kind of absconded with by people who don't understand Greek or idioms um, in order to argue for a flat earth that has nothing to do with the text here. Um, and it would be kind of ignorant of how this term is used uh, by Semitic people such as John. The four corners of the earth is a Hebrew idiom for the whole world. Isaiah eleven twelve 12 uses it this way. Uh, he will lift up a standard for the nations and assemble the banished ones of Israel and will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. We know from Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 29 that the extent of Israel's dispersion, uh, their final dispersion, is going to be over the entire globe, over the entire uh, earth. All of God's creation that is inhabited by mankind will have Jews found in it. Uh, this is the idiom in Hebrew. In Revelation, in the Greek, it's consistent in the book of Revelation here, chapter 7. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. So if you look at the end of this verse, we get a description of uh, what would be affected by these angels at the four corners holding back the wind. And we see that it's the entire earth and all of the sea and any tree. Uh, this being a uh, full negation, meaning not one tree that exists. And so the entire earth has to be affected by this. It is the four corners of the earth. Uh, this comes from the cardinal directions, north, south, east, west. Uh, in all four directions, uh, there will be no wind. Revelation 28, then, that uh, they are from the four corners of the earth. We see later in the verse that the number of them is like the sand of the seashore. This is speaking of the population of the earth at the end of the millennial kingdom. Genesis 22, 17, which looks into the eternal state after the millennial kingdom, will be there in a few weeks. It says, well, I wish we'll be there in a few weeks, but we'll be there in the text in a few weeks. Uh, Genesis 22, 17 says, indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand. Sorry, this is Genesis 22, 17, not speaking of the eternal state. This is the promise to Israel uh, back in Genesis. Uh, I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. So this is speaking of uh, global population at uh, record levels, you could say. This is one of God's creation purposes, was that the earth be fruitful, multiply, and that it be filled. Uh, Genesis 1.28, God relaying his purpose in creating man to man. He says, God blessed them and God said to them, that is to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Both of these purposes are going to be fulfilled in the millennial kingdom, not just the perfect rule of Jesus Christ but the command to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Again and again and again throughout Scripture, God reiterates this command to, uh, to mankind and Israel as well. Um, in fact, after the flood, this is the first thing that God says to Noah is go and fill the earth, be fruitful and multiply and fill it. Now, this is going to be accomplished in the millennial kingdom, specifically because mortals are going to enter the kingdom. At the end of the tribulation period, there will be a number of mortals who survived physically and who have believed in Jesus as their Messiah. And so they will enter into the kingdom without regenerated bodies, but having the salvation that seals them. 
And so they will be able to reproduce still in this kingdom in a restored and perfect environment with God's king on the throne, uh, holding back all war and uh, other things that um, harm and destroy us in the present day. They are going to have a perfect environment in order to reproduce in. They're also going to have their ages restored to pre-flood ages, at least, um, if not possibly even uh, Garden of Eden ages, which just would be not dying at all. Uh, Isaiah 65, 20, speaking of the uh, messianic kingdom that was promised to Israel, says, no longer will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days. In other words, no infant death uh, in the millennial kingdom. That would speak of abortion as well as dying outside the womb. Uh, no more sudden infant death syndrome in the kingdom, in other words. Probably no more sudden adult death syndrome either. Uh, although we will see, actually, that's not quite true, but it's going to be a little different. No longer will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his days. For the youth will die at the age of 100, and the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thought accursed. Now, what's going on here is uh, fellowship with God is going to produce long lives. Those who have received Jesus, the king, who is going to be their present physical ruler on the earth, they receive him as their savior, as their Messiah, then they are going to perhaps be regenerated at that point. If not, they are going to at least live out full lives. But the one who does not believe, the one who is rebellious, is going to die at 100 years old, um, or in other words, living out a normal uh, post-flood um, human length of life. Uh, they are looked at as youths still dying in their youth uh, when they die at 100, but they won't have the opportunity to continue spreading to other generations as uh, prolifically as believers will. Uh, so believers living uh, up to a thousand years, uh, perhaps even longer, I don't think there will be any believers who die during the kingdom period, um, but unbelievers will die at a young age. So we've got a massive boom in population during the kingdom. God created this earth. He knows how many people can it can hold, and he's going to allow his purpose to be fulfilled during that time while also still holding back the tide of evil for the whole thousand years. Now, Zechariah 14, uh, verses 16, really through 21, it's a bit of an abrupt end to the book of Zechariah, but it speaks of the time of the millennial kingdom, uh, the promised messianic kingdom, and it gives us a specific scenario uh, that I think is actually going to play out in future history. Zechariah 14, 16 says, Then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went against Israel or against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths. And it will be that whichever of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. So the scenario that's happening here. Zechariah 12 was the rescue of Jerusalem at the end of the tribulation period uh, during the War of Armageddon. We looked at that a lot when we were going through the War of Armageddon. Uh, Zechariah 13 is the internal cleansing of the nation of Israel. Zechariah 14, the first half, um, is that final judgment on the world at the end of uh, the tribulation period. And now here we move into the messianic kingdom that comes right after that. And we see what that uh, kingdom is going to look like in that all those nations that were gathered against Israel just earlier in this chapter in the uh, battle of Armageddon, now they are going up to Jerusalem to worship the king. So that would be those believers, the, uh, the sheep in the sheep and goat judgment, who were allowed to enter into the kingdom those nations are going to be subject to uh, Jerusalem 
and they're going to be expected to show up at the Feast of Booths. Now, the Feast of Booths is a feast of Israel that has not been fulfilled yet. It is actually the festival of the promised kingdom uh, or the presence of the Messiah. Um, it's also called Sukkot and uh, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, perhaps you've heard it uh, called, where they would remember their wilderness wandering um, and the promised land uh, that they were going into, but they remember it in its um, in its fulfillment when the Lord fulfills this promise of a promised land to them, where they would go out uh, outside of Jerusalem and they would pitch tents and they would live in those tents. So the Feast of Booths is going to be, uh, I believe, the high festival of all of the earth at this time. Uh, right now for Israel, their high festival is really Passover. Uh, this promise, uh, remembering how God uh, brought them out of Egypt, the Feast of Booths is going to become the remembrance of how God brought them into their land, into the kingdom. Uh, and so all of the world is going to celebrate this. Those nations who fought against Israel are going to celebrate this as well. But within those nations, there will still be some rebellious factions, people who have been born during the millennial kingdom and have not shared the faith of their parents. They've not um, put their faith in the one true God, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so their uh, land will be judged. It says, uh, it will be that whichever of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. It, uh, and now in verse 18, I think we're given a scenario of when this is actually going to happen during the millennial kingdom. It says, if the family of Egypt does not go up or enter. Now this if in the Hebrew uh, gives us the impression that this is a true scenario. It's the sense of if and take this for granted, the family of Egypt does not go up or enter, then no rain will fall on them. It will be the plague with which the Lord smites the nations who do not go up and celebrate the Feast of Booths. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations who do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths. So after who knows how many years, some of these nations that did not experience the tribulation, they did not experience the rescue of believers um, by Jesus Christ at the end of the tribulation, but they have been born into this millennial kingdom with a dictator, a righteous, a true, a perfect, a gracious, a loving dictator, but one who is ruling with a rod of iron, men and women who still have a sin nature. A sin nature, if we learned anything from the law of Moses, is inflamed by rules, especially when those rules do not come alongside the spiritual enablement to do it that the Holy Spirit allows. And so uh, these men and women who have not put their trust in Christ's righteousness, but trust in their own, are going to be inflamed uh, by this righteous king who rules righteously, and they will rebel, at least in their hearts, against him. And this rebellion will kind of slowly fester through these thousand years. And it's going to come about that there is going to be uh, rebellion at the end of the millennial kingdom by those mortals um, who were produced during the millennium uh, and uh, who choose to align with Satan. And this is going to be a final cleansing of the land. So that brings us to the Gog Magog issue in Revelation 28. Oops, let me go back and point that out again. So he is going to deceive the nations. They're in the four corners of the earth. That means the whole earth. And then he's specifically calling out Gog and Magog. Now, this causes some issues because there's a Gog and Magog war in Ezekiel 38. And now here he has brought it up again in uh, the millennial kingdom and some point out that the prophecies in uh, ezekiel 38 comes before ezekiel 40 and through 48 which is a description of the millennial kingdom 
So it seems to come sequentially before the inauguration of the kingdom. But here in Revelation, we get it at the very end of the tribulation period. So the problem here is that the timing is different. It's called Gog and Magog, but one happens at the end of the tribulation and one happens at the end of the millennial kingdom. One follows, or one, uh, not at the end of the tribulation, the beginning of the tribulation. One precedes war and uh, tribulation and the other uh, follows uh, global peace. Now, as you go through these passages, you see that these wars are described in completely different terms. Uh, there are some similar aspects because it's war uh, and God is involved, but the timing is different, as was just noticed. Uh, the catalyst is different as well. In Ezekiel's war, uh, the Gog and Magog war, God assembles these armies. But in the millennial war, Satan assembles these armies. In Ezekiel 38, 16, it says, It shall come about in the last days that I will bring you against my land, so that the nations may know me when I am sanctified through you before their eyes, O Gog. God says to them, I will bring you against my land, Israel. And he calls this in the last days. Now, the last days throughout all of the Hebrew scriptures refers to that transition point between the present age and the coming millennial age. This can be during the millennium, it can be preceding the millennium, um, but it can't be after the millennium. Uh, that is no longer the last days. There is actually no, uh, no Hebrew expectation of anything after the kingdom. Uh, they, by default, expected it to last forever with an eternal duration. It was a new revelation in the book of Revelation that there would even be a rebellion during this millennial kingdom or after. Um, and we did deal with that a couple of weeks ago in our uh, characteristics of the millennial kingdom. Um, so go and take a look at that video if you haven't already uh, to see just exactly what they expected and what was new information in Revelation. But Revelation 27 has a different character causing uh, this rebellion to happen. It happens under the permissive will of God, but God is not the one driving this. Satan and his own will is driving this um, to counter God or to oppose God. Revelation 27 through 8, which are our verses tonight, uh, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for war. Uh, the number of them is like the sand of the seashore. Now, the descriptions are also different. In Ezekiel's war, we see that God uses both human warfare, disease, and nature against the opposing armies, whereas in the millennial war, he uses no intermediaries. He himself sends down divine fire um, in order to accomplish his victory. Ezekiel 38 to 19 says, In my zeal and in my blazing wrath, I declare that on that day there will surely be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. The fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all the creeping things that creep on the earth, and all the men who are in the face of the earth will shake at my presence. The mountains will be thrown down, the steep pathways will collapse, and every man will fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against him on all my mountains, declares the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother. With pestilence and with blood, I will enter into judgment with him. I will rain on him and on his troops and on the many peoples who are with him a torrential rain with hailstones, fire, and brimstone. So this is how the war of Ezekiel 38 is described. Um, I guess it fight. This is actually Revelation 20, verse 9, not Ezekiel 38, 21 here. This is the description of how the Gog-Magog war at the end of the millennial kingdom concludes. It says, They came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. No human warfare, uh, no use of pestilence, no use of wild animals. It's just God sending fire down to devour them. 
He snuffs out this rebellion in a moment. Now, the real issue here is that Ezekiel's war stands as a prototype in future history. Uh, kind of like we have things like Waterloo, where we would say, oh, that was that uh, person's or that uh, nation's Waterloo. Uh, for us, we might think of Pearl Harbor or even 9-11. Uh, when we discuss a future war we, or a war that's present or something, we can say, oh, that's, that's like Pearl Harbor. Um, if we want to be talking about a sneak attack, or it's like 9-11 uh, if we want to talk about terrorist activity. And so there is the possibility here that this is being used as a prototype. God already did this once in the Revelation to John, where in the end of uh, Revelation chapter 19, he used similar imagery uh, to the Ezekiel War, um, but didn't anywhere bring up the names Gog and Magog. But that imagery is supposed to remind us or remind them of the war that happened before the tribulation began in Ezekiel's war. Uh, whereas this war at the end of the millennium, again, is reminding us of the war that happens to Israel um, before the tribulation period. And there's a very specific reason for that. And it all has to do with what Satan lost at the end of the tribulation period. Revelation 17.5 tells us uh, that mystery that John saw uh, when we were uh, heading into all of our detail about Armageddon, the final stand of Satan and the false prophet and the false messiah on this earth before Christ returns. And we see that uh, Satan has a throne on this earth, a kingdom, and that that is Babylon. So it says, on her forehead a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Well, this goes all the way back to the beginning of Satan's uh, development of his kingdom to oppose God's kingdom. Right after the flood, just as God wiped out God, uh, Satan's previous uh, rather unorganized rebellion, Satan begins an organized rebellion, where he organizes the people of this earth to be under his will rather than under God's will, and so rebel against the will of God, rebelling against God's kingdom. So here it says the beginning of Satan's cosmic throne as the king of this world after the flood, and this is a picture of Babel. Uh, this is where it began, and it culminates in the tribulation period. The uh, Babylon, mother of all harlots, is the genesis of all uh, opposition to God in this present civilization from flood to uh, the end of the tribulation period. Uh, at the end of the tribulation or during the tribulation, when Satan comes down to place his throne on this earth and to place his intermediary king on this earth in the false messiah, he chooses this city, Babylon, because She's the mother of all the cities and all of the uh, rebellion op against God on this earth that subjected itself to Satan. So Satan's cosmic throne is restored at the end of the present civilization, and that's mystery Babylon. That Babel and Babylon returns to the world scene as Satan's throne. Uh, and this constantly throughout scripture is opposed to God's uh, chosen intermediary throne on this earth earth. Just as Satan's raising up Babel, God is pulling uh, Abraham away from the scene at Babylon to cultivate his own kingdom. From Abraham comes Moses, actually, as an intermediary ruler between God and God's chosen nation, um, and that develops into the period of the judges and then of the uh, eventually of the kings, where he's got David sitting on his throne, and God promises to David your throne is going to be an eternal throne and you're going to have an eternal descendant on it because the kingdom that was not ruled on God's behalf in Adam, God is going to restore to this earth and he has chosen the line of David. He has chosen the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who is perfectly subject to the will of God because he is God and he is perfect man. And so he can sit on the throne of this earth as a man and he can rule perfectly in God's will because he's God. Uh, this is what Satan has opposed. There's two kingdoms rising up, 
One is Satan's cosmic system and the other is God's kingdom uh, civilization. But the problem for Satan at the end of the millennial kingdom is Babylon is gone. There is no more Babel for him to call upon uh, to rebel against God. Jeremiah 51, 24, in fact, all of Jeremiah 51 is speaking of the permanent and final destruction of Babylon. It says, I will repay Babylon and all the inhabitants of Chaldea for all their evil that they have done in Zion before your eyes, declares the Lord. Behold, I am against you, O destroying mountain who destroys the whole earth, declares the Lord. And I will stretch out my hand against you and roll you down from the crags, and I will make you a burnt out mountain. They will not take from you even a stone for a corner, nor a stone for foundations, but you will be desolate forever. Now, it's really that last clause that I pulled this verse out for. That's Jeremiah 51, 26, where they're not going to be rebuilt at all. The destruction of Babylon happens at the end of the tribulation period before the millennial kingdom begins. And when the millennial kingdom begins, this nation will not return. Nations who have believers are going to return, but Babylon is going to be left desolate. Uh, personally, I believe if there are any believers who are part of Babel or Babylon, uh, these will have to find other nations to dwell in because the judgment on Babylon as a nation was that it would not exist anymore. Isaiah 13, 19 says the same thing uh, a little more clearly, or at least more uh, pithy. Um, Isaiah 13, 19 says, and Babylon, the beauty of kingdoms, the glory of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited or lived in from generation to generation, nor will the Arab pitch his tent there, nor will shepherds make their flocks lie down there. Now, the plot of land is still going to be present on the earth, but this is what Isaiah predicts it will be like in the millennial kingdom. Desert creatures will lie down there, and their houses will be full of owls, Ostriches will also will live there, and shaggy goats will frolic there. Hyenas will howl in their fortified towers and jackals in their luxurious places. Her fateful time also will soon come, and her days will not be prolonged. So in other words, there's not going to be anything there in that area except desert creatures and some other wild animals. It is going to be completely uninhabited by any people. So when Satan comes back onto the world scene at the end of the millennial kingdom, his throne is gone. There is no kingdom for him to rule over. And so he calls on the one nation that was the last one to war against Israel. Uh, this was his last stand before the tribulation, before his throne was allowed to come back onto the earth for a time um, in order to be destroyed. And so he calls upon this nation, Gog and Magog, to be his new Babylon. So this is Satan's millennial Babylon, is Gog and Magog, his last effort to establish his cosmic throne. Now, this should show us the patheticness of evil. His throne is gone. His throne is destroyed. Um, and he's just grabbing what he can. And so he grabs Israel's last rebel enemy, Gog and Magog. And he says, okay, I'm going to make a thrown out of you. Let's go for it. So we saw why he was released. He was released for the purpose of deceiving the nations, and his purpose of deceiving the nations also has a purpose, and that is to gather these nations for war. It says he will come out to deceive the nations, which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. So here's an artist rendering with the dragon over this uh, camp of enemies that looks a lot like sand on a seashore. And he is amassing them, all these rebel millennial mortals, in order to come against God, who is dwelling physically um, in the or in Jerusalem on the throne of David. So we see how he arrives. It says they came up on the broad plain of the earth. Now coming up, um, if again, you look back to our video on the character and whatnot of the millennial kingdom, 
uh, you'll see that there is going to be what's called a millennial mountain. We see this all through the uh, the prophets, especially the uh, well, actually the major and the minor prophets, pretty much evenly in the Old Testament, uh, that God is going to raise this mountain uh, high above the rest of the earth. Now, if you think about it, uh, the flood really disrupted God's created geography, where uh, mountains were raised and uh, islands were raised and sea levels or sea beds dropped to fill up with the water. And at the end of the tribulation period, we see that restored, where the mountains are going to sink, islands are going to sink, the earth is going to become relatively flat compared to what it is now, um, flat surface, not flat earth. Um, you always got to put that in there, sadly, these days. Uh, the mountains are not going to be as high and as steep. You're not going to have Mount Everest at 29,000 feet or whatever that's at. Uh, but you will have still uh, mountains, and Jerusalem is going to be at the top of the highest mountain. Uh, so they are going to come up on the broad plain of the earth. They're going to surround the millennial mountain. They surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. Now, most people don't divide these two ideas. They make this one idea, the camp of the saints and the beloved city. I think really the idea here is a temporary dwelling of believers outside the city as well as the city. And I think this is specifically the celebration of the Feast of Booths. The nations are rebelling against Jesus and their rebellion, the best that they could do, was not come to the Festival of Booths. And so what a perfect time for a rebellion to occur, but at the Festival of Booths. Uh, we see God speak of temporary dwellings in similar ways in Zechariah 12.6 says, in that day, I will make the clans of Judah like a fire pot among pieces of wood and a flaming torch among the sheaves, uh, so that they will consume on the right and on the left and on the surrounding peoples, while the inhabitants of Jerusalem again dwell in their own sites in Jerusalem. So this is Zechariah 12, speaking of the uh, battle of Armageddon, where uh, the faithful of Israel at the midpoint of the tribulation got out of Jerusalem, just like they were told by Jesus in the Olivet Discourse, when they see these things coming on the city, get out. Those who believed got out and went to Petra and were in temporary dwellings. Now, they're still Israel. They are Israelites living in temporary dwellings, while the rest of their brothers and sisters are still living in Jerusalem. So we have the inhabitants of Jerusalem dwelling in their own sites in Jerusalem. But the Lord says, also, I will save the tents of Judah first. So that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the of the inhabitants of Jerusalem will not be magnified above Judah. So we have this distinction. We've got the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the tents of Judah, the temporary dwellings of Judah, as they are dwelling temporarily in um, in Petra. Oops. Zechariah fourteen nine through eleven. Uh, we see this uh, again. The Lord will be king over all the earth. In that day, the Lord will be the only one, and his name the only one. All the land will be changed into a plain from Geba to Rimon, south of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem will rise and remain on its site from Benjamin's gate, as far as the place of the first gate to the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananel to the king's winepress. People will live in it, and there will no longer be a curse, for Jerusalem will dwell in security. So Jerusalem is given its full glory that it's promised in its kingdom, and it is raised above the rest of the earth. So that rest of the earth is the broad plain that they are rising up against this millennial mountain, Jerusalem, and the uh, those who have come to celebrate the Feast of Booths, being the believers that are not rebelling against the king, have come to Jerusalem. But having all the believers gathered together at Jerusalem during a millennial feast of booths and having the rest of the world gathered against them on the broad plain, God has already isolated the rebels from the, uh, from the uh, followers by their own choice of activity. 
fire is going to come down from heaven and devour those who have come up against uh, Jerusalem at the festival of booths. So here it says, then the devil who deceived them. So the devil who tricked them, the reason they're all dead here at the end of this uh, millennial kingdom that they lived under the perfect authority of Christ. Uh, they had a thousand years in a perfect environment um, to believe in him and uh, let that teach us a lesson about human nature, that it's not our environment that's our, uh, that is the reason we're not believing. Uh, like we mentioned a bit before the class, some people uh, have a hard time getting over the obstacle of, if God is so perfect, why is there injustice in this world? Well, here they are going to be living in a kingdom that has perfect justice, and they will still choose not to believe in Jesus as the Messiah. Now, they will believe in his physical presence. It would be hard not to. He is going to be sitting on the throne of David physically. They will know he's there. They will know he's king, but they will not trust that he died for their sins and that they need his righteousness and not their own for salvation. They will rebel against him. And it was really, at the end, the devil who tricked them, who deceived them into coming up against him in war, thinking that they could take his throne. And so the result is that the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone. There are where the beast and the false prophet are also. And the duration was they would be tormented day and night forever and ever. And that's it for that. We are going to come back next week and look at the final judgment where uh, we're going to see the books open, the great white throne. God is going to judge every unbeliever. So this is only the judgment of the wicked dead. We finished all the judgment of the um, believers before the millennial kingdom. Those who believed during the kingdom were uh, translated. There's no more resurrection because no one died um, who was a believer there is only translation uh, where they will be regenerated and whether that happens at the time they come to believe in jesus the messiah or not i don't think that's the case um, i think they live a mortal lives um, to the end of the millennial kingdom continuing to reproduce continuing to raise uh, children to fear the lord jesus christ who will be sitting on the throne of david uh, but anyways, we will look then next week at the judgment of the wicked dead and the putting away of all evil in history, that answer to uh, the injustice of this world.